Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd like to um, welcome you all to this virtually Cochrane session on our Plain Language Summaries Project, or fondly abbreviated to PLSs. Um, my name is Jo Anthony, and I'm Head of Knowledge Translation for Cochrane. And joining me for this session today are the PLS, the Plain Language summary project team which has been involved in this project for the last 12 months or so and we're going to introduce the panel members in, in a moment or so. Um, what we'd like to do today is to introduce the 12-month project that has been undertaken since May 2020 amidst the uh, organisational response to the COVID pandemic and tell you a little bit about how the project was put together who was involved and what we did, what we set out to achieve, and also our preliminary findings as um, part of the press. We have um, coming to the end of the completion of the evaluation of that project. So today you will hear from the key members that have been part of the project together with the experiences and reflections from some of our Cochrane groups involved in, in the process. So just to begin with, um, I just wanted to give you um, a quick word or two about why this is so important. Um, knowledge translation means lots of things to different people. Um, it's nothing new, but here in Cochrane, we define knowledge translation or KT as the process of in the use in practice. So providing the best possible evidence to the right decision makers to inform those health decisions. Part of that is making our evidence accessible and usable. And that's the key aim of delivering Cochrane's organizational mission. So communicating Cochrane evidence in plain language is really critically important. Plain language summaries of Cochrane reviews are included in every Cochrane review and they form the basis of all our dissemination products, such as press releases, podcasts, infographics, and any other visual dissemination products we might produce. We also know that plain language summaries are often the first, if not the only way, that an external stakeholder can connect with the organisation. They come to Cochrane to find the plain language summary, and they read that and then act on um, their, and, and inform their decision making as a result. So we know how important these are. The Plain Language Summary Project started in May last year, as I said, uh, to see where, whether a team of professional science writers could improve the quality, consistency, and tra translatability of our PLSs. So this presentation and workshop outlines how we set about it, our experiences of writing PLSs and the challenges that we faced, how we evaluated the project, the conclusions we reached, and the guidance and learnings that we have produced so far. Joining um, me on the panel today, I'm delighted to say my co-sponsor of this project, uh, Toby Lasserton, who um, most of you should know, um, Deputy Editor-in-Chief for Cochrane, also, um, I'd like to introduce you to Elizabeth Royals, our copy editing um, manager, who works as part of our editorial and methods department. Our three science writers, our plain language writers that um, we recruited last year and come from a background of systematic reviews. Um, they also have experience in science communications, and also um, multilingual expertise, which is very important when we are considering translating our evidence, not just in English. So um, I'd like you to, to introduce you to Carolyn Hughes, Denise Mitchell, and Nicole Pitcher. We have some short um, introductions and presentations, some of them are video, and then we're followed by a panel session, and we look forward to hearing your questions you can submit those questions as part of the session. Um, and we also are going to explain how uh, further on in the, in the session, how you can engage with the panel uh, towards the end. And we hope that we will have at least 30 minutes to answer questions 
and hear from you as well, as well as your experiences. Um, if you find a, uh, uh, you'll see there the questions on the right hand side. If you find a comment or a question particularly relevant, uh, please vote on it by clicking the thumbs up button and we will uh, address as many questions as we can. Uh, we were also asking you some questions via the poll function, which is on the right hand side of your screen. You will need to click on the poll to see the question and submit your response. Um, to get us going and to start us off, we'd like to understand a little bit, of, a bit more about you and who's joining us today. So um, can I ask you first with the first poll, there's two questions there. Um, who, who are you <laughs> and uh, which of the best describes you uh, and how you use or write Cochrane PLSs? So feel free to um, contact um, click on the poll on the right hand side and then select the, the options that best describe you. Okay, um, I will be able to provide some details and some responses to those questions um, uh, while people respond, uh, but in the meantime I would like to uh, begin um, the presentation and begin to share some of our work with you. Um, by introducing Elizabeth Royal, our Copy Edit Manager from Cochrane, um, and a short video from her. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm here to give you a brief introduction to plain language summaries in general and to Cochrane's plain language summary project in particular. So let's start with what are Cochrane plain language summaries? Well, they're pretty much what it says on the tin, a short and simple summary of a Cochrane review. All Cochrane reviews are published with a plain language summary or PLS as they're frequently referred to. They were first introduced about 20 years ago. The length, Format and content has varied somewhat over the years. They started with a word limit of 100, which was then increased to 400 and 700, and most recently increased to 850. Why are Cochrane PLSs important? They're important because goal two of Cochrane's overall strategy aims to make Cochrane evidence accessible and useful to everybody everywhere in the world. That is, everyone should be able to understand our evidence and we should present it in a format that is most useful to our readers. Plain language summaries are sometimes the only way that people access Cochrane evidence. Plain language summaries are the most translated Cochrane evidence format, and they can be translated into up to 14 different languages. They may be the only Cochrane evidence that is available in a reader's native language. Historically, they've been viewed as being largely for consumers, but we do know that now they are also appreciated and recommended by healthcare professionals and form the basis of other Cochrane dissemination products such as press releases and featured reviews on Cochrane's website cochrane.org. Their titles are also used as the basis of social media posts. So why do we need to run a PLS project? Although PLSs have been around for a long time, their quality has always been highly variable. Some are excellent and some have just not been written in plain language. So the aims of the project were to employ professional writers to write plain language summaries to try to improve the quality, consistency, and translatability of the resulting PLSs. 
and also to inform PLS guidance going forwards. We recruited a team of three writers, Carolyn Hughes, Denise Mitchell, and Nicole Pitcher. The writers have a wide diversity of experience. Carolyn has extensive experience as a scientific writer and editor. She has worked with NICE and the NHS and is a Cochrane consumer author for at least one group. She is currently on secondment from the All Wales Therapeutics and Toxicology Centre. Denise Mitchell has a background in marketing and communications. She first came to Cochrane in 2013 as an assistant editor, sorry, an editorial assistant at the Wounds Group. She started copy edi editing for Cochrane in 2015 and is currently the senior copy editor as well as a plain language summary writer. Nicole Pitcher has a background in research and a PhD in epidemiology. She formerly worked as the Senior Research and Dissemination Fellow at Cochrane France and has translated a fair number of PLSs while she was in that post. So what did we do? We asked the writers to produce plain language summaries for reviews when they reached the copy editing stage before publication. We routinely wrote PLSs for two, all reviews and updates coming from two Cochrane networks. The MOS network, which stands for musculoskeletal, oral, skin and sensory, and consists of eight Cochrane review groups and the Public Health and Health Systems Network, in which five out of six Cochrane Review Groups participated in the pilot. We also wrote all the PLSs for reviews that came from the Central Editorial Service, which at, for the last year has largely dealt with COVID-19 material, although we have also had some other high profile reviews come through. The writers also wrote PLSs for reviews that came from 21 other Cochrane Review Groups. These were generally high profile reviews such as electronic cigarettes for smoking cessation, smoking cessation for mental health and wound cleansing for treating venous ulcers. We also wrote some in response to requests from the review groups to do so and also to widen the experience of the writing team across Cochrane. How many PLSs have we written since May? Well, a lot, 152 in total, 120 of which have been published. There is a reasonable lag between copy editing and publication. It can take another six weeks. Uh, before publication occurs. So as you can see, most of the PLSs that we have written have been for the groups involved in the project. So the MOS network, Public Health and Health Systems network, and the Central Editorial Service. 23 reviews had PLSs written from other groups. In total, uh, the, the project has had 35 of Cochrane's 52 review groups participating at some point, though for many of them, this only involved a single review. I'm going to finish my part of the presentation now, but before I do, I would like to ask you to complete another poll. You will be able to find it on the right hand side as you did the earlier one. So if you write plain language summaries, what are your main challenges? And if you don't write them, what do you think the challenges would be? Would they be deciding what to include, deciding what to exclude, sticking to the word limit, using plain language or some other point? 
The next part of the presentation will be given by Nicole Pitcher and concerns challenges that are faced by the writers. We will find out at the end of the presentation what you consider your challenges to be, and it'll be very interesting to see how those chime with what Nicole is going to talk about. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. For this presentation, we've highlighted three of the main challenges that we faced as writers and how we tackled these. The first one was actually defining what PLSs should cover and what their purpose was. It might seem like quite an easy question to answer. And um, indeed, at the start of the presentation, Elizabeth outlined what we all in understand by PLS. But when we started off in this project, it was clear that some people might view summaries as encompassing each of the main parts of a Cochrane review from the background through to um, implications, whilst others were quite keen for it to focus on the key messages of the review. And it was also important for us to gauge who we were writing for so that we could tailor the PLSs appropriately. So after consulting with various key stakeholders within Cochrane, we agreed that PLSs would be brief descriptions of the main points of a Cochrane review with key messages because it was clear to us that that's what many readers will be interested in primarily when looking at PLSs. We didn't highlight a population in particular as being a target audience, so be it patients, carers, journalists, etc. Instead, we decided to take an approach that's similar to news, UK newspapers, for example. Um, so targeting a reading age of around 14 years old, so that we could make Cochrane evidence accessible to the widest possible audience. Once we'd done that, we could get on with writing PLSs. And though the challenge was identifying helpful resources to simplify Cochrane terminology and to simplify clinical terminology. Perhaps surprisingly, um, I'd say that Cochrane jargon isn't as big an obstacle to writing PLSs as you might expect. And that's mainly because a lot of it refers to methods and you wouldn't expect to cover much about methods in a PLS. So thankfully, we don't have to mention things like risk of bias tools, etc. But uh, the Messier standards and uh, standards for reporting plain language summaries that already were in place when we joined Cochrane do ask that we mention um, the certainty of the evidence. And we're also encouraged to mention the limitations of the evidence. So for that, there is some guidance in the Cochrane Handbook, for example, narrative statements of how you would present conclusions, not necessarily in um, plain language. And there are certainly some areas where we felt that we could contribute, for example, a criteria for downgrading the evidence, publication bias, indirectness, are terms that will mean little to people outside of Cochrane. There is also the challenge of simplifying clinical terminology, which as people who write in plain language, we're familiar with. But some Cochrane reviews do cover particular technical um, language, things that you might not expect to see in a patient information leaflet, for example. Um, and so you might not easily find resources online that explain these things in plain language. So our approach was to develop resources where we felt there weren't any um, to help writers. For example, that includes suggestions for how to simplify Cochrane jargon, where we felt it was appropriate to do so for PLSs. We've also been building a glossary of definitions as we go along that we produced as part of PLSs and that could be reused by others. And we've also put together a list of helpful resources because there's no need to reinvent the wheel if we know of resources that are already out there. 
The third challenge that we wanted to mention today was that of fitting the plain language summary into what at the start of the project was a word limit of 700 words. We know that writing in plain language uses more words than writing in technical language. And we put up an example here where you might get away with mentioning anticoagulants in an abstract, but where you would need to explain that in the PLS and it takes many more words. Bearing in mind that Cochrane reviews typically include 50,000 words, um, it's a bit of a challenge to reduce that to 700 words. And so we asked as a team to increase the word limit to 850 words in December, 2020. And I'll come back to that in a couple of slides because it will illustrate that whilst we found some solutions to the challenges that we met, sometimes they raise new challenges. But before I do that, um, I thought I'd share the findings from an evaluation of the project. We were very lucky as part of this project to be able to draw on the feedback from over 450 volunteers who read plain language summaries that had been drafted by writers. So Denise, Carolyn and myself, um, and who compared that to PLSs that hadn't been drafted by us, but by Cochrane groups. And there, um, the feedback was that 88% of people said that they found plain language summaries written by ourselves to be easy to understand, which we felt was encouraging. Um, and there were also 74% of people who said the same for um, PLS is submitted by groups. So, um, you know, broadly speaking, people seem to find them relatively easy to understand. Interestingly for us though, people were quite generous with the feedback of what makes a good PLS according to them. They really like key messages. That was a first lesson. They really like short PLSs which has to make us smile when we've just asked for an increase in the word count, but it illustrates some of the tensions that we might face when we're writing a PLS in that we need words to explain complex terms um, and yet people want something quite short so that we don't drown them in words. So that's a little bit of a challenge for us. People also said they like headings that are phrased as questions. They like the same headings to be used in the same order across different plain language summaries. They like us to explain certainty of evidence in uh, terms that are understandable, practical, and they ask for us to develop a standardized template. So um, at this stage, I will uh, pass on to Denise, who um, will explain how we've actually moved on from realizing that we found some solutions, but not all to the challenges and how we could build on the feedback that we'd received from the volunteers to build resources for future writers at Cochrane. Thank you, Nicole. Hello. So what I'll be doing in response to the evaluation that we had and in response to what we've learned so far we started off by developing a PLS basics document. And the idea is that this is somebody who's writing a PLS, perhaps for the first time and with no experience, can use to take them from a blank piece of paper to a finished PLS. So it takes you through the steps of writing a plain language summary. For example, when you first start thinking about writing your plain language summary, you have to identify identify what is going to be the key points for the reader and you have to decide what to include and importantly what you need to leave out. It will also cover the do's and don'ts of PLS writing. So for example, uh, use short sentences, use short words, avoid jargon, um, avoid or explain technical terms if you can't avoid it. So this fo will focus on the style and the structure of the plain language summary. We also explain what to include in each section of the PLS. Um, so we, we go through each section step by step and we give examples 
from PLSs that we've written. So we include key messages where possible. And I say where possible because we've already said that we need to explain technical terms. So if you have a review question that is quite technical, it may be that you can't express that very clearly as a key message. And for example, I'm going to read this. Uh, if your review question was automated mandatory bolus versus basal infusion for maintenance of epidural analgesia in labor, you might struggle to express that succinctly in plain language at the very beginning of your plain language summary. So if that's the case, you need to put your key messages further down when you've explained all the key terms. Um, we also give practical ways of expressing certainty of evidence, and this would be usually as narrative statements based on the Norway template. And we also suggest ways of explaining limitations of the evidence. So sentences you can use to explain that um, the studies did not use robust methods, for example. But the key point is that we give lots of examples from PLSs that we've written. As Nicole said, we'll include tools and resources for plain language summary writers. So there'll be a glossary of technical and common terms, not so much a glossary, more how you can say something in plain language. Um, again, with examples and links to plain language resources. So as requested, we have developed a template. We're starting with intervention reviews. It may be that we develop templates for other sorts of reviews. Um, we're not sure. Um, the template uses standard headings. So they're all the same in the same order across PLSs as requested, beginning with key messages, again, with the proviso that it might not be appropriate for your review. And the standard headings that we're using are, uh, what is the condition? So to give a bit of background, for example, what are pressure ulcers or what are rapid point of care tests? Then what did we want to find out? What did we do? What did we find? What are the limitations of the evidence? And how up to date is this evidence? And we give suggested text for each section. Uh, we're also including a checklist, which is very much a work in progress at the moment, so that PLS writers can check that they've covered all the most important points. Well, that concludes the presentation. Uh, so it just remains for me to thank you for listening and to thank all the people mentioned in this slide for all their work on the, on the pilot project. Um, and also thank you very much to all the CRGs who participated because uh, obviously, we couldn't have done it without them, and some of them weren't part of the project, so that's brilliant. Uh, so I'd like to hand over to Jo now, who will introduce the panel for your questions and also the results of the poll on what you found challenging. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. That's great. Okay, so you've heard from the panel um, pre-recorded. Um, uh, now meet them live and in person. Um, we have a number of questions um, which uh, I'm going to pose to the panel that we can answer. Uh, feel free, free to um, to continue to um, uh, to send your questions in. Uh, just in response to the poll we asked at the beginning of the presentation, so who are you and what is your main role? Forty-three percent of of you joining us today are representing Cochrane Review Group staff, which is fantastic. Um, Eighteen percent are authors. 11% consumers, 7% um, from the uh, central executive team and 20% other. And uh, the second question was which of the following best describes how you use or how you write Cochrane PLSs. 44% um, of you say I edit PLSs as part of my work. So that's CRG or copy edit. 26% say I use PLSs to disseminate information about Cochrane evidence. 40, um, sorry, 14% I write PLSs as a Cochrane Review author, and 16% I read PLSs as a consumer. So that's fantastic. Thank you very much for that. Okay, so um, I'm going to go with the questions uh, with time allowing. Uh, we do have 29 minutes left for questions. So I'm going to go with the most popular questions um, first. Um, but I'd like to just open it up to the panel. First question then. Um, what are your thoughts, um, and I suppose this is to the writers, what are your thoughts about the use of graphics 
or including videos in PLSs? Did the project look at that? Um, and, and how did you come across that as an experience uh, during, during this pilot? Can I take that? Please do, Denise. That's, that's a good question. Thank you. Um, we know that people really like graphics and it's, it obviously really helps to illustrate the points that you want to make. Um, but we didn't use any uh, in our PLSs because there isn't the foot in Redman. So uh, it is something that we would like to develop. And in fact, there are other things at the moment like um, visual abstracts, which are being developed. And I think that they use the plain language summaries as a basis, but um, we could do that, although we would very much like to. Okay, any other comment from anybody else? I think that, that, that's a good summation, thank you, Denise. Okay, the next question is about, um, plain language summaries can be accessed directly via the organizational website, which is Cochrane.org. If an editorial note is posted on the main text saying, for example, that a review is out of date or should not be used for decision-making, this is not visible in the PLS. Users will not see it unless they click through to the full text, which defeats the object of the PLS. So can the team comment on how Cochrane will address this issue? Okay, shall I take this? Um, this is, I'm afraid, somebody else's job. It's not the PLS writer's job. This, uh, you know, we do not publish the PLSs. We don't put them onto Cochrane Org. Um, so I'm not quite sure how we would do it, but I think it's something we should take on board and make sure that this inquiry goes to the right person and that some sort of action is taken. But I'm afraid I can't say who it is or what the action exactly will be at the moment. But thank you for raising that. No, it is a very good point. And I think that would um, this would inform our future recommendations how we integrate into, into .org. Okay, the next question. Um, instead of plain language summaries, should Cochrane invest in summaries for particular audience types so that for, for which the review is relevant? So policy summaries, patient summaries, research summaries, uh, clinician summaries, rather than just having one size fits all. Toby, do you want to have a go at that? Yeah, I can, I can answer that, Joe. Um, so this, um, this came up um, in one of the discussions that we had uh, recently as a, as a group. We met to talk about this. It was quite a... Uh, I think a, a sort of a, a tension within the team, if I can, if I can use that, uh, use that phrase. Um, and I, um, I actually feel that um, it's it's one plain language summary, and I think it's probably got to do the best job that it can um, for as many readers as possible. So I, I, I kind of I, I know how you could you could take out certain sections. So a research summary, implications for research. Um, I can see how a policymaker might be interested in, a, in maybe issues around implementation or cost if that's been subject to evaluation in that particular review. Um, but I think the standards that we've got, the guidance that we're looking to develop and the way the process as we've, we've kind of imagined this has, has been uh, run has been really targeting one, one PLS. So it's, it's, it's difficult to see how um, we could come up with different rules for different audiences when the aspiration, I think, is uh, for all reviews to be uh, as relevant to as general an audience as it's possible. I think that the research audiences or um, sort of the policymaker audiences might be interested in particular types of reviews uh, or particular review questions. Um, but um, I think until we've got an effective means of, of identifying which ones they are, um, what their needs, the specific needs are, it's going to be hard to embed that in, in a single, um, single bit of territory in the, uh, in the review itself. We may have to think about other products that would, that would sit alongside the review to meet that particular need. Thanks, Toby. Um, next question. Um, 
this is a, a the question that, that, that pertains to the resources that we have developed or are we currently developed and it's a comment here that sound they sound very useful particularly the glossary um will they be made be made available to crgs to use i can probably answer that one as well um yes absolutely um but there is a process to to validate them and to ensure that they're um that they they they're doing what we need them to do so um i think we'll we'll look to get um the um the resources pack that that um uh, document that i think denise um, highlighted to um the editorial board in cochrane um but i also think that um as with a lot of these things um it's how they get get used and what people's experiences uh, are like in using them so um I think we'll we'll look to uh, to ensure that, that that's as, as widely disseminated as possible through uh, through networks and um, through groups. But the the idea is that it becomes something that um, is a, is a useful sort of go to place for uh, how to write uh, PLSs. And Toby, while you're there, there's another similar question um, regarding the handbook, which we know is a is a key resource um, for our community. So do we see that this would be updated with more guidance on how to write PLSs in the future? Um, so the, I think the PLS section will be in the reporting chapter, which is um, it's not in the, the physical book, it's in the online online versions. And we, we've historically seen um, the handbook as containing sort of the, the guidance for uh, sort of the methods piece um within the review and um the reporting guidance has been has been put into the electronic version so we, we there are i think there probably is an opportunity to look at where where the pls piece comes in um but i think um the, the um the guidance that the the team are working on i think is more um it's 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 it's, it's a bit more than um uh how to write a summary of a review there's some really um i think you know my understanding is that there's going to be a lot more about um uh how to you know, phrase limitations and um how to um how, what's what i'm looking for uh, uh the, the do's and don'ts and the sort of the 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 attributes of plain language which i think um are the team have got have gathered some really great insights into um, whether that all goes into into one chapter or one place, I don't know. But I think it certainly is a, a resource that that probably should, for the minute, uh, deserves a life of its own outside the handbook. Okay, thank you. Um, so I guess question back to the writers then, in understanding a little bit more about what we found. Um, and I know that this is very early days for us. We're still evaluating um, the the analysis of of, of that stakeholders. Um, uh, responses to us um, on how they found the project PLSs. But do we know if people finding a PLS um, easier to read correlates with their understanding of the concepts being conveyed? Did we evaluate that? And is there any, any findings or reflections that the writers can comment upon? Maybe not. Am I, am I still live? I think we're still um, taking in the results of the evaluation. I think it's, um, it's still a bit early to say exactly um, what's what as far as the evaluation goes. Okay, but we will be uh, communicating those findings. Thank you, Brian. That's uh, an important question, and we'll make sure that we. Uh, we um, we come back to that. So the next question um, is about what are the plans for improving PLSs across Cochrane reviews? Um, having dedicated staff to write would be good for consistency and quality, though I don't think that would be feasible across all reviews. Um, can we provide any more details on the longer term plans? I can try and give an answer. I think um, I think we'll we're 
obviously having taken in the evaluation, I think that the point about the feasibility of dedicated staff across every review is certainly certainly true. Um, it's it's quite a challenge, and I think um, even um, even though we've seen you know a uh, huge amount of learning within that team, one of the most important things I think that we can do from this project is actually ensure that 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 what we've learned is disseminated as far as possible. And that isn't just about um, uh, who writes them. And I think the, the evaluation showed this quite nicely. It wasn't so much the difference between the PLS is written by um, the writers versus uh, the sort of the business as usual uh, language summaries that I, I took notes of when I saw the data. It's actually what, um, what users noticed and liked about uh, the PLS is irrespective of who wrote them that I thought was um, generated some of the most valuable insights. So, so that, that the guidance that I think the team are going to work on, I think um, is probably going to, going to be working harder than any of us in the future when it comes to, um, uh, you know, um, uh, improving PLSs. But I, I feel that um, historically we've taken sort of a, a cyclical audit approach um, with PLSs and we, we, we could do that again. Um, but I think it should be done once we've 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 launched um, uh, the resources pack that the team have been working on. Thank you. Um, again, just to um, get a little bit more detail and understanding on the writer's reflections to share. Can we talk? There's a question about the the longer word limit um, and your experiences of of working with that um, writers, as it's often hard to explain some of those conditions which you talked about, Nicole. Um, both conditions and interventions within a plain language, um, and then include relevant information. Do you want to just give a, a brief overview of your thoughts on the word limit and what you found easy and more challenging to work with? Yeah, happy to. Um, so I suppose from um, the desire to explain terms, we've really um, pushed for increasing the world limit. And then when we realized from the evaluation that people prefer short PLSs, um, we were faced with a conundrum of, are we just trying to include too much information in the plain language summary? So that really raises the question for us. And it would be interesting to get sense from the wider community within Cochrane what the purpose of describing the background in a PLS is. Um, you know, we're not, we're not say, the equivalent of an NHS patient leaflet where we explain the condition in detail. We really want to be just providing enough information for people to understand the content of the PLS. Um, not too much, not too little. That's really the trick. And it's interesting that um, from the poll uh, of deciding what to, um, deciding what the challenges are for people who write Cochrane summaries, I can see uh, that there were actually around a quarter of people who found that deciding what to include was one of the trickiest part. And a quarter of them who said that it was deciding what to exclude. Well, I think that's really interesting because um, that's one of the main decisions you have to make when you're writing a summary. And as writers external to their review, it's not always easy. We didn't have much interaction with authors. And that's something which I think as a team of writers, we felt perhaps um, we could have benefited from or in future if it is authors who write them then I guess that takes it away. But it's interesting that they'll still have a challenge of figuring out what to include and what to exclude. And I should add that as a researcher, um, I can see the temptation having spent two or three years, if not more, on a Cochrane review um, to <laughs> add in as much information as uh, is possible in the PLS. But actually it sounds like the audience who reads them would like as little information as possible. So. That's the challenge we have to take up. Okay, uh, Denise or Karen, do you want to add to any of that? 
I think Nicole summed it up pretty well. It's, um, it is difficult, certainly if you have a very long review that's very complex to fit all the important points in. Um, and if there's if there are things you need to explain, for example, if it's for a, a DTA review and you need to talk about sensitivity and specificity, I, I don't know that many people just know what that means. And I think that there are some things you have to explain. And the more you need to explain, the more words you need. Sometimes it's unavoidable. Um, I also think from the evaluation, the people who wanted the really short PLSs tended to be people who read a lot of them, maybe like journalists or um, clinicians or um, yeah, people who who needed to see a lot of them to take it in. Whereas I think that the, the genuine lay readers um, appreciated the explanations a bit more. Thank you. Okay, um, there is a question here about, um, in terms of presentation and the fit and placement of the PLS within the review, would it not be better to have the PLS before the more specialist and technical part of the Cochrane review? Uh, quite a popular question here from, from, from the audience. Uh, what are the panel thoughts on that? Well, I think there's a lot of sense in that, but at the moment, our software means that it is published after the abstract. And I'm sure that this will be looked at along with a number of other features in the not too distant future. And so things may change. Uh, probably a good idea to find out where people would like it before we move it though. So we might have to ask them some, some questions round about before any decisions are made. Okay. And then and in the context of the review as well, we talked about visual um, uh, products, but there is a question here about um, blog shots um, and other dissemination products. Could they be incorporated into the PLS too? Often less, uh, also less is often more, especially for those with low health literacy or short attention spans, low tolerance for text, like many in the younger tech savvy generation. How can we access the power of social media for PLSs? Any thoughts on that? I think that's a question for you, Joe. You're the KT person with access to Cochrane.org, where we have free reign to do whatever you want. Yeah, I mean, very much so. I mean, this is um, Toby and I have discussed this about how we can use the PLS as the backbone of the, the dissemination strategy for any. Uh, communicating the findings of any review and how we can build into other products, particularly uh, targeted at specific audiences. That would be something that certainly I would love to see. Um, uh, it all starts with the PLS and then you build off there for particular targeted audiences. And certainly um, in, when I think of um, media panels, certainly in the last six months or so where we've been responding to uh, pandemic or rapid reviews, we have used the PLS alongside other dissemination products, whether they are an infographic, an author Q&A, a blog shot to disseminate specific audiences. The question, I guess, is, is how they can be permanently or integrated in some automated way into the review. I don't know whether, Toby, you've got anything to add on that and your feelings moving forward as we, as we build the next stage of this project. Um, I'm, I'm open to a lot. Uh, generally, as, uh, speaking, when it comes to this, I think um, we've seen what what visual, how powerful visuals really are, and I think um, certainly over the last twelve months, it, you know, that's that's how you communicate things rapidly. Um, people are uh, people do respond, I think, more to to visuals, the impact of visual things rather than the written word. Um, I, um, I I can't, I don't know too much about uh, how uh, how sort of um younger users um access that stuff and how they communicate it i don't have a lot of of expertise possibly because of my my growing number of years but um i think um i think if we if we get a sense that that's that that's a you know a strong a strong way for people to communicate quickly for evidence to be um taken up more easily i think that's something we would we'd obviously try to do i think the important thing with with visuals is to um agree with the standards for them um, I think that's it's a really important, but you know, possibly more important to do that for something which is sh shared as, as rapidly or can get shared as rapidly as a, as a visual summary, um, and working out hosting 
uh, hosting of that, that stuff. Um, actually, if I could come back to the one of the earlier questions about editorial notes, I, I've been um, um, I've been asking one of the um, one of the, my team about about that, and um, I've been assured that we've got it, it's a known issue. The editorial note coming over to, to PLSs, inc including translating them as well, which we know is quite an important um, uh, feature of the of the .org um hosting of plain language summaries um and they're we're looking to um to get um a solution for that after a meeting in may okay um question here which i think is quite important how long does it take to write a pls considering you probably have read the review first carolyn do you want to take this one please yeah sure um we came down to about five five to six hours to write the PLS because you have to familiarise yourself with the topic, often look up lots of the terminology and how you're going to put it in a format that's going to interest a lot of different readers with different needs. Um, I think it took us a lot longer than five hours at the beginning, some of us, but we've, we've ended up about five hours to write one and then maybe another hour or so to revise is it after you've had time to, to sleep on it? Okay, thank you. Um, and for the PLS basic guidance, um, the documents and guidance that you're developing from the project, uh, do you see that as replacing PLEAX or used to revamp it? It's not very visible or widely used at the moment as a comment here across the organisation. And I know this is something that we we talked about at the very set at the outset of the project, but using the Norway examples and what we already had in terms of existing resource with PLEAX. But what did the, the writers, what do you think we should do going forward? What were your understandings? Do you think that we can build on that, replace it, or or um, uh, um, revamp it in some way? Happy to kickstart on this one. Um, <laughs> my experience of trying to use the existing guidance, so PLEAX as well as the template developed by um, the Cochrane Norway team uh, and other resources within Cochrane, is that there is a lack of harmony between them. And with our guidance, we'd actually be adding to, um, quote, the mess, unquote. <laughs> <laughs> and the lack of visibility and, and legibility for anyone writing a PLS. So um, I think certainly one of the recommendations at the end of the project would be that whatever is decided, whether um, there still is a role for PLEAX as a complement to our guidance or not, it can't just stay as is because the two documents are not compatible and give different um, suggestions to writers. So it will be really helpful, I think, to harmonise the guidance and possibly just limit it to one main resource that people could go to. I'd, um, but sorry, I, if I can come in, I, I feel that's, that's a really strong point, um, Nicole, about harmonising guidance. I think the fewer places you can direct people to the the better. Um, I mean, I, I, I have a conflict. I obviously was involved in PLEAX so as um, part of the project team that, that wrote it. So I, I, you know, I don't know if I can speak with huge authority and or license, but you know, uh, it's 10 years old. The work that we do is actually older than that, I think, 2009, 2010, started looking at it. So um, I think, um, I think to me, it, it feels like it, 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 it you know, it, it was a set of standards that define the attributes, what is in a PLS. You can judge a PLS by that. The guidance piece that I know that I've really spoken before that you've, you've been working on is more about the how to do it rather than the what piece. So the, the how rather than the what. How is this resource? What is, is, is PLEA? So I, I think they, they can be, be differentiated. And I think for the purpose of this project, it's good that they have been. Um, but I, I think. I think either harmonisation or a retirement plan, I think would be would be good, provided that there's that there's a, a resource that 
takes the best of it and obviously benefits from the experience and uh, the insights that you lot have gained. Okay, um, we have a lot of questions here, so I'll try and try and get to the, the ones that are the most popular. Are there efforts underway to integrate PLSs within the actual, plain language, sorry, within the actual review, starting with the question itself and carried throughout the review, so that it isn't all just focused on the PLS developed after the review is complete? So integrating plain language across the entire review, good question. I think um, what we've seen so far, I mean, I'd be interested to, to get the views of, of others on the panel on this, but I think what we've seen so far is it's quite a struggle to do it in 850 words. Um, and if the average review, was, what was it, Nicole, 50,000? That that might be quite a, quite a struggle to do it across everything. Um, yeah, that's, that's what I think. Other thoughts? Well, I think that having the plain language summary should negate the need for people who would find reading the review difficult to read it. Hopefully it will answer enough of the questions without them actually having to go to the full works. And that will be accessible for the people who, who need it and, and need the extra detail. Uh, but I, while I would love to see them written in, plain language throughout, I don't know that it's going to happen. Okay. Can I just jump in and say that as someone who has used a lot of Cochrane resources to conduct non-Cochrane work, I think it could be a really strong argument for pushing our guidance on plain language summary writing um, within but beyond also co the Cochrane community. Because one thing I've found is that when I now write scientific articles, I do try and write them in plain language. In fact, I can't not stop myself from doing so. So it's possibly good news <laughs> that maybe that will happen in future if we nail the guidance. Okay, um, I have a, uh, a sound that uh, suggests that we're running out of time um, very fast. So apologies um, uh, if we have not got to all of your questions. I'm sure that we'll be able to take them offline and get back to you. Although I did want to just um, uh, congratulate uh, the panel. Thank you very much. You have had a comment here that says, well done on a great project. What is the next step for the project? Um, well, certainly um, the, the plan is that the evaluation is now complete. Uh, we are still writing up the, the findings of, 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 uh, of, our, of our responses. Um, that was across translatability, understandability, use of plain language, and also quality assurance as well. Um, we have um, started to share that information with a few critical friends, and I would like to do uh, give a big shout out to Claire Glenton, who has worked very closely with us on this project and also um, is a keen supporter of this project. And also our KT work with the dissemination checklist because the two are aligned. Um, Toby and I would like to um, uh, work with the project team on the final recommendations and guidance that we would then submit to Toby and Carla and the editorial board for next steps and stages of this project. Um, and I hope that we'll be able to then communicate what those next steps are. But a huge thank you must go to all the CRGs that participated in this project. And we continue to want to involve and engage with as we now test those recommendations going forward on how we how we improve and, 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 and um, our PLSs. So more to come. And we will keep you very, very close to that. Toby, is there anything you want to add to that? No. Any other comments from the panel? Okay, so um, I'm conscious that the seconds are ticking. Um, thank you very much indeed to the panel. Um, thank you to, the, to you all for joining the session. I understand that there's now a 15 minute coffee break uh, followed by a live quiz at 5 p.m. And this is an opportunity to bring together people for a bit of fun and socializing. Um, if you'd like to join the live quiz, then if you click on the join section 
and you'll be assigned to smaller teams uh, with your colleagues. But in the meantime, um, please feel free to email any of us uh, with any of these questions, and I hope you enjoy the rest of Virtual Cochrane programme. And it's been a delight and a pleasure to be able to join you today. Thank you very much. Thank you.